Right, we're diving into the deep end of the pool for this video. We try and pick apart one of the most complex parts of the F1 car. It's fancy current generation hybrid engines. This is another thing about which most people have a vague idea of what's going on, but don't really know what's happening, or how the whole power unit works in harmony. And for good reason too, it's um, complicated. Don't worry though, we're going to take it bit by bit and piece the whole thing together. Lucky you. Back before the hybrid era, the power unit was just your standard petrol engine, burning fuel and spinning wheels. Sure, it had a Kurs device bolted on, a small battery charged under braking, but this was more of a fun add-on. A taste of things to come. You may have seen this graphic in the corner of the screen, showing how many of the six elements of the power unit a driver has used so far this year. Do you know what each of the six parts of the power unit are, and how they work? Well, we're going to go through them one by one. Right now. The internal combustion engine, or ICE, is the part you're all familiar with. It's the gas guzzling engine part. The current ICEs are wee little 1.6 litre direct injection turbocharged V6s. Yeah, what? Okay, so this is basically how a combustion engine works. It's connected to the wheels via a crankshaft. Crankshaft is basically just the pole that spins around and around and around really fast. The engine turns the crankshaft and the crankshaft turns the wheels. How does the engine turn the crankshaft? Well, with pistons pumped inside the cylinders. See the V6 part means the engine has six cylinders arranged in the V formation, like this. Inside each cylinder the engine forces a tiny explosion by igniting fuel and that explosion forces a piston to turn the crankshaft. Let's pop our peepers inside the cylinder for a sec to see what's going on. It'll be important to understand how the rest of the power unit connects. So a traditional normally aspirated engine like the ones we used to have would suck air in, mix it with fuel and spray that mixture into the cylinder and ignite it to create a tiny boom that works the piston. The downside of this is it's hard to get the right mixture of air and fuel and a lot of the fuel goes unburned and ejected out into the exhaust as waste. That's less efficient and powerful than we'd really like. But these current engines are direct injection engines. That means the air is sucked into the cylinder separately from the fuel, which is injected directly into the combustion chamber in the cylinder, in exactly the quantities needed. More fuel is burned, less is wasted. And you have far greater control over the air to fuel ratio in the cylinder, which gives you better control over the power. That air to fuel ratio is important. If you're going to burn more fuel, you're going to have to suck in more air. And how are you going to do that? Well, that's where the turbocharger comes in. The turbocharger is bolted onto the waste pipe of this combustion engine. The waste gases leave the cylinder in an awful hurry, at which point a turbine, think of this as a small, faster version of a wind turbine that you see in any field, captures all that fast moving air, spinning up a treat. And I mean really spinning up a treat about 100,000 times a minute. This spinning turbine is connected to a compressor, which is actually basically just another spinning fan doing exactly the opposite of the turbine part. The compressor sucks air in from the outside and forces it back into the engine to give it the extra oxygen it needs to burn more fuel. That's how you get more boom for your buck. The turbocharger looks a bit like two snails stuck together in real life. So what else can we do with the energy from the waste gas? Well, as well as driving the compressor, we can use the turbo's turbine to generate energy, actually like a wind turbine. The MGUH, or Motor Generating Unit Heat, can do just that. The energy can be sent straight to the energy store, or the MGUK, and we'll get onto what those are in just a sec. But first, let's look at the other extremely important use of the MGUH. As with a lot of components of the current power unit, the MGUH can work both ways. Instead of sucking energy out of the system for later use, it can also drive energy back into the system, specifically back into the turbo. Why? Why would it do this? Well, here's the thing about turbos. As they're driven by the exhaust gases from the engine, the speed at which they're spinning depends on what the engine is doing. 
if you've come off the accelerator pedal, the engine slows down, there are less exhaust gases being pumped into the wastegate, and the turbo starts slowing down its spin. That means when you put your foot down again, it takes a while to speed the turbo back up again to force the air into the cylinder and give you the full oomph of that extra turbine power. The time it takes to get the turbo back up to speed is called turbo lag. What the MGU-H can do is quickly boost the turbo back up to speed when the car accelerates, so the engine doesn't have to wait for the turbo to catch up again. It takes energy from the energy store and just feeds it straight back into the turbo to go whoop and spin it back up. In this way, F1 power units have essentially eliminated turbo lag. Let's talk about the MGUK then. That's the motor generator unit kinetic. Kinetic meaning movement. Like the MGU-H, it's a generator that works in two ways. It can capture energy from the car under braking, i.e. all that energy from the spinning wheels is stolen from the MGUK and stored away. In reverse, the MGUK uses that stored energy to feed it back into the engine, generating up to 160 brake horsepower more driving power. Alternatively, it can be used to drive the MGUH if needed. Now we come to the energy store. This is where all the energy recovered from the MGUK and the MGUH is kept, so it can be used for all the things I just mentioned. Think of it as a big, very awesome battery. In fact, it doesn't actually have to be a battery. The rules technically allow for a number of storage solutions. Fire wheels and honking great capacitors are allowed, for example, but just think of it as a battery because we're keeping things simple here. It's a unit that stores energy. Now the control electronics unit. This one is a bit more technical and not worth going into, and in fact the whole mechanism inside it I don't understand right now. But let's just mention there are two types of electric current, DC and AC. You've probably heard of them. The battery operates using DC, and the MGUs operate using AC. And it requires a very clever bit of engineering in the control unit to do all the conversing as the energy passes between them. It gets very hot very quickly. In fact, a lot of the power unit parts get very hot very quickly. And it's a miracle they've shoved the whole power unit into a tight space without blowing up more than four times a season. Let's look at the whole thing working together then. Note, the way I'm arranging these components isn't the way they'll be laid out in the actual cars. This is just for ease of explaining what's going on. Let's sit the combustion engine here. It's chugging away, sucking in air and fuel and expelling waste gases and driving the wheels. The turbo takes those waste gases to drive a compressor that sucks in even more air, driving it into the engine to give it more power. The MGU-H takes energy from the turbo to keep stored for later, or to power the MGU-K. And it can also be used to take that energy and accelerate the turbo. The MGU-K steals energy from the wheels under braking to store for later, or to drive the MGU-H. And again, it can use that stored energy to add more oomph to the engine, or the MGU-H. In practice, then. This is your car, barreling down a straight, accelerator is down to the floor, the internal combustion engine is at full whack, sucking in fuel for max power. The turbo is running at full speed, feeding more air into the engine. The MGUK is drawing energy from the battery to drive the engine even harder. Maybe it's taking energy from the MGUH too. The MGUH giving any reserve energy it can and passing it on to the storage in MGUK. This is about as much oomph as you can get. Then the car gets to a corner. The driver takes their foot off the accelerator pedal and hits the brake. The work going on in the combustion engine drops dramatically. The MGUK starts sucking energy out of the spinning wheels and storing it in the battery. By doing this, it also adds the braking effect, slowing the car down. The turbo is now dropping in speed as the waste gases are slowed coming out of the engine. As the car exits the corner, the driver puts their foot down again on the accelerator. The engine fires back up, feeling the need for speed. 
The MG UK drives more power to the engine, but the engine also needs fuel and air to accelerate the car as quickly as possible. But the turbo has dropped in speed, so it can't feed as much air as you want. This is when the MG UH comes into play, using the stored energy to give the turbo a kick back up to speed ASAP and get the engine up to max power. So hopefully that gives you some sense as to what all the bits and bobs of the engine are for. There are variations in how the scenario I just played out will run, depending on how much a driver is going for max power versus fuel saving. These kind of things will dictate how all the different parts are working to deliver and save energy, but you get the idea. 